Hi there, welcome to Boxing Deep Dive. I'm Lyndon Hosking, and this is uh, Classic Fights, where we uh, revisit uh, old fights from the past, hence the name Classic Fights, and uh, go back over them and uh, and just see what was great about them. Um, I'm joined tonight by two co-hosts, Michael Tamur and Peter, Peter Maniatis. How are we, guys? Great to be on hey, the show, guys. We're without Tazzy uh, tonight, uh, but he's here in spirit, so... Um, I, like we said before, I don't know who we're going to argue with tonight, um, but maybe, Peter, you might have to step up and um, get a bit narky uh, this week. But, um, Tazzy, all the best, mate, and we'll, we'll see you next week. Um, we're back to me this week. Last week we had a good response with the... Uh, who was it last week? Waters and Norris. What a great fight that was. Yeah. I think that was you, uh, Mike, wasn't it, that one? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's back to me this week, and I think I've come up with a really good one. Uh, this is an unforgettable fight. It is, of course, the Julio Cesar Chavez Meldrick Taylor first fight. Uh, the fight took place on March 17th, 1990, at the Las Vegas Hilton. It was for Chavez's WBC Super Lightweight title and uh, Meldrick Taylor's IBF Junior Welterweight title, which is the same division. Uh, Chavez came in at 68 and 0 with 55 KOs. Taylor was 24 0 and 1 with 14 knockouts. So, Pete. Um, I don't know, you're probably the same as me, Rewatched it, and uh, geez, what a classic fight it was. It was, it was. When you watch fights, you always get a different view on how it was, and back then I was a massive Chavez fan, so I was always, sometimes younger, you watch it, you watch your idols a bit more than what you did Mel Taylor. didn't give him enough credit. Mm. Just some of the moves and the combinations he was putting together, and the speed, it, it was unbelievable up against... Really, back then, it wasn't a, a downhill shot as you're still at, at basically his prime. Mm. So yeah. it was an awesome performance. Yeah, it was. And, and Mike uh, Chavez was obviously 68 and 0 and just the absolute pride of Mexico. Meldrick Taylor, though, Olympic gold medalist and um, an absolute hot shot of the time. He was pretty much the equivalent to Floyd Mayweather back, back in the day. Well, like Pete said, they're both at their primes. And Meldrick Taylor, probably a lot of people thought was just he's only 23 years of age so olympic gold medalist but went to the olympics 18 years of age captured the world title with a terrific late round stoppage over buddy mcgurt and at 23 years of age this was his opportunity really to step up and be the next breakout american star so when you look at two fighters it's very rare where you get two sensational fighters unbeaten with the kind of backgrounds both guys had clashing at the absolute height of their prime, which is what this fight brought to the table. And I think that what made it so interesting was just the contrast. You had a, a flashy American, fast hands, good speed, good angles, and you had the relentless Latino who come to march and walk you down. It was going to be, I guess, a game of cat and mouse and whether Taylor had the capability to hold him off or whether... Chavez had the, the ability to withstand the speed and the angles and not become too deterred by that. But in terms of like when you're scripting a fight and looking at how two styles could potentially mesh, I think these two were the perfect match because you had, like I said, you had Chavez, who was a brilliant offensive fighter, who was a lot smarter defensively than people thought. Mm. And you had Marjorie Taylor, who was such a fast, smart, swift, skillful operator. But being from Philly, he loved to hold his ground and throw down. Just, just a tantalising clash. Mm. Well, Pete, it was billed as um, Thunder versus Lightning, and um, it really was uh, that type of fight. And as, as Mike just said, even though Meldrew Taylor had the beautiful, silky skills, just, just a brilliant fight. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he might have been the youngest gold medal or one of the youngest gold medal winners ever. But, but he, he did fight like that typical Philadelphia fighter, all heart. And he'd stand with you. Even though he wasn't a big puncher, he would stand and, and go to war with you. He would. And he, the flashy hands, too. When he landed one, he landed two, three, four combos. He just had everything you'd want in a fighter. And um, Chavez back then was just a relentless body puncher as well. Not many people wanted to tangle with Chavez and just sit there. But he was basically gunslinging with Chavez and backing his own speed and backing his own power. And... You know, that, that, that was the chemistry of the whole fight. And we were basically at the time, you know, it felt to me that we were unleashing the next superstar of boxing mm. and then it didn't happen. 
Mm. It was one of those things that you have to see the fight to see it. But that, you know, that last round, if we had to chop that last half of the round out and Melry Taylor had been able to flurry and move around and get a win, that, that would have copperstrated mm. him to a different hemisphere in boxing. That stoppage like that ruined a lot of his momentum going forward in his career. Yeah, it did. And Mike, uh, you know, obviously we'll see from the, from the clips in a minute though, but um, such a, a great fight. Um, a valiant effort, and by both fighters, by the way. But you'll see here that Meldrew Taylor just wasn't quite the same after after this one, was he? No, but he was still good enough to win the welterweight world title, mm. which a lot of people forget. Yeah. So you know, he went up there. Went two fights later, he defeated Aaron Davis, who was thirty-two and all at the time. So mm. still talented enough to win the welterweight world title, but it just goes to reflect that people really thought he had the potential to be a generational talent, like his other colleague from the 84 Olympics, Pernell Whitaker. And it's really this fight, without spoiling it too much, it's this fight that offsets him for the rest of his journey. Yeah, and you're right. Um, well, let's, let's just go to the, the highlights of it. We can have some comments during, during the, uh, the fights. We're gonna do it in two parts. We're gonna do highlights of the first 11 rounds. And then we'll watch the last round in full because um, almost positive everyone's seen this fight. But if you haven't, um, what um, you know, a, a chain of events that that, uh, that come about. So, so let's get started now. We've got Tazzy uh, making a uh, a cameo in that bottom corner as well. But this is uh, yeah, the highlights of the first eleven rounds. And um, what was surprising here, I thought, was that Chavez was always a bit of a slow start. He tried to come out and take Meldrick Taylor on, but. Taylor wasn't having any of it, Mike. He, he was he was up for the fight. No, he's picking him off early. There he goes. If, you, if you look at him, holds his feet, throws the one-two, and then steps out. It's not that, it's not that he's trying to box and chuck to him from range by using his feet too much. Like I said, Taylor had that, that typical feeling style where he can be a little slippery and slick, but he'd rather make you miss by, by millimetres than inches. Mm. He did, and, and that's the thing too, um, Mike, yeah, with Chavez too. Like, he, he's, he, like I think Mike said before, his defence was actually really underrated. Like, he was a come-forward, typical Mexican boxer uh, or fighter, but he was actually very hard to fit, and probably a little bit like Canelo these days. He would make those punches miss by, a, you know, a centimetre or two and didn't really take a lot of punches. Ch Chavez, to me, and I know you guys will agree with this, has one of the most efficient styles of all time. Mm. In that you can see here, he's constantly forcing, even when he's losing the rounds, he's forcing Taylor to carry his weight. And the other thing Chavez did well is he closed range with his feet much more rapidly than people thought. Mm. And it's that presence, that presence bearing down on you. Like you said, with, with Canelo, it doesn't even need to be a punch output, but just the physical presence draws false moves out of the opponents. Mm. He's very good at cutting off the ring as well. Chavez and setting the trap and landing his body shots and he's always got that game plan he's going to slow you down as the fight keeps going and he's going to motor on that's his game plan yeah you can he see starts that, moving gears yeah I was going to say Pete you see there that um, Taylor standing in front of him still giving him angles but Chavez he's just always there isn't he he's always in there and he's taking you know uh, Melvin Taylor looks like he's winning most of the combinations but you can just see inside some of the work that Chavez is doing those little hooks to the body uppercuts to the head he was taking a lot of punishment as he was going along, even though he was winning the rounds. Yeah. You see, like, rapid, rapid fire speed of Taylor, but Chavez, much heavier puncher of the two. And mm. especially to the body, those studding body shots, they take mm. their toll. Well, Pete, they, I think um, I read too that um, leading into the fight that they had a, pretty much a big circle around the ring in training for... For Taylor, where you know he wasn't allowed to tread because they didn't want him on the ropes, and I don't think he really got caught really at all on the ropes during this fight. You can see he's actually taking center ring against Chavez, which is just unheard of. Yeah, I know it was just one of those performances that when I was watching, I remember watching it's like I, we're unleashing the next superstar of boxing. Mm. This guy could be like Sugar Ray Leonard, and then it just it, that's how funny boxing is, isn't it? Just one punch at any time. Can see some guy go from Sugar Ray Leonard, and he, he's six foot six, and he shrinks to five foot two, and de deflated in just one split second. And you used to see it in Mike Tyson's fights, he'd look a million bucks, and then you go, uh oh, that's the point now where Mike, it all goes wrong. And you, it, it happened here very. I, I don't want to give it away, but 
I just would love to have seen what would have happened if Melrick Taylor had have maybe taken it. Being that far in front, it's like a marathon, maybe just box a little safer and, and done a little bit more movement when he needed to do and just win it, win it, you know, a bit more safer. But he didn't want to do that. He, no. just, kept, he just kept going at it and going at it. Exactly. I was just going to say, Mike, you know, if he had a, maybe taken a leaf out of... Um Sugar Ray Leonard's book against Hagler, he fought really, really smart where he threw the punches, he just enough punches to actually land and steal the rounds and do enough. Meldrick Taylor, you can see here, he's just working hard every round, every round's just a grind and he's standing toe to toe with Chavez and even though he might be winning rounds, he won't take a backward step and rest or, or take a round off even. I just don't think it was in his DNA. Mm. You go and watch earlier career fights of his, the only blemish on his record was the draw with with Howard Davis, yep. which was more guy he had to march down. But from that fight, there was rounds he was controlling and then he'd get drawn into exchanging at the wrong range the last 30, 40 seconds of the round. With Robin Blake, early career, he got drawn into exchanging too much in the trenches. Mm. We saw it time and again with him. I just, I think that they say, you know, you can, you can take the fighter out of Philly, but you can't take the Philly out of the fighter. And mm. I think that he always had that just ingrained in him that if he got tagged, to get it back and against someone like Chavez at the Russian roulette. Yeah, Pete, I mean, but if you look at him here, he looks like, like I said at the start, he looks like he's got all the skills of a Mayweather, but probably not the smarts because he doesn't, he's got the skills of Mayweather, but doesn't fight with the safety first mentality of, of Mayweather. And just, you can see here, even though he looks almost exhausted, he just will not take a step back. And as, as such, he's taking a lot of unnecessary punches. Yeah, that's just a Philly attitude, I guess. They had him pumped up. He's 23 years of age, and he's winning the fight. So they're just mm. probably saying, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. You're winning the fight. Don't change your method. It's working. And we'll, we'll get to it at the conclusion of this round, but there was no advice from his corner following this round to mm. take it safe, to play it safe. The advice from his corner was that they needed the final round. So yeah. even though he was miles in front on two of the judges' scorecards, they were concerned of the, the Chuck Jumper card, which he was down by a point remarkably. Mm. And I think that they were concerned because of because of Don King's proximity and his, his tightness with the WBC, with the WBA, I think that they were concerned that they were going to get a bad decision, mm. which is why they kept sending Taylor out to take it up in the trenches. Well, that's the thing, Pete. I mean, uh, we haven't got it in in, um, in the corner here, but yeah, it's exact, exactly that. Here he's trained other George Benson, Lou Duva, both saying, you need to win the round, you need to take the round. And you could see the look on Taylor's face. I mean, he knew what he had to do, but he was busted up. You could see he was exhausted. In, I mean, in hindsight, it was not the greatest, greatest advice, but do you think that even they would have thought he was, you know, it was that cl close or that far apart that he had to take that last round? No, everyone watching the fight knew Taylor was in front. Mm. And, um, you know, one, I think one judge had it five points up, the other one had it six points. Of, one judge had Chavez in front by a point. That's mm. fine, because yeah. guess what? You're still going to get your, your hand lifted and everyone just goes, that, that judge is a crook. Mm. So it doesn't matter. It does, that judge exposes himself. I mean, Chavez would have known at the end of that round, don't worry, that, you know, there would have been a master sheet there, there's a supervisor... The spies, he would have known, listen, you, you're going to need to knock him out to win. He, yeah. he would have got that 100%. He would have got the whisper, you're yeah. behind on points. Yeah. They, there's and, always someone telling the point scores. Yeah, and, and the thing is, too, Mike, in the in the corner, when when you do see uh, he's trying to say that to uh, uh, that sort of thing, uh, Vane, to uh, Chavez, you can almost see that he's almost resigned to the fact that he's going to lose and just, he looks pretty downtrodden. Now, I don't know, judging the fight, I judged it again today, and I think I think you would have been doing well to give Chavez maybe three rounds up to that point. So, um, but it was just amazing to see that he, he came out in that last round. He almost looked forlorn and, and the result was gone, but obviously history is a wonderful thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, look, Chavez's corner, they had to be realistic. Unless they knew the fix was in on the scorecards, mm. they, yeah, like you said, there's... There's no way he won more than three rounds after mm. 11 in, in yeah. my view. So they, they knew what they needed. They knew they needed a stoppage. Like I said, I think the other corner, they're the ones that probably maybe been on the end of a few uh, questionable decisions in recent times. It's a Duva boxing versus Don King event. Yeah. 
Don King's the lead promoter. I think that they were thinking the worst of the situation. The other thing is too, look, they knew their fighter better than anyone. Maybe they knew that with Maldrick, if you told him to take his foot off the gas, it would have the adverse effect. Yeah. That yeah. he might mentally shut off. Yeah, so that's a good point. You, you never know there either. Yeah, you're right, because sometimes yeah, to go against the fighter's natural natural mentality and instinct, it can actually have the adverse effect. And um, you know, is that is, we discussed before, is that type of fighter who is a, is a warrior, even though he had those brilliant skills and then maybe telling him to take the last round off was just against his DNA and would um, short-circuit the robot as such. So, so let's go into the last round. As I said, I, I had it eight rounds to three at this stage. That was probably being kind to Chavez. But um, let's go into round three, watch it in entirety, and uh, we'll, we'll comment at the end of it. There you have it. Larry, 92, 108, 101, Meldrick Taylor. I think he's won his way to a unanimous decision. If you're a fight fan, get ready for three minutes of high drama now as a desperate and determined Julio Cesar Chavez tries to take out a fading and battered Meldrick Taylor who has completely dominated him through most of the fight. Both of Taylor's eyes are closing. The blood continues to flow from his nose and his mouth. But if he stands up, he wins. Now here's, he's a warrior. Look at him. He's trying to stay there and trying to apparently push Chavez out. Play it safe and box. Meldrick Taylor said before the fight, he'll take me to a higher place. He's and there he right has. now. He's there right now, Larry. No question about it. Well said. historic unbeaten streak. You would expect the aggression to be with Chavez. It's more so with Taylor. He's found like he's behind on points. Well, they're both tired. Watch your head. But you're right, Ray. It doesn't appear at this moment that Chavez has the stuff to get it done. More pawing than punching now at a time when he needs the best. Another solid left hook from Meldrick Taylor. So there it is, 2.58 of round 12. So um, I think the interesting thing to note with that was that if I had, like I said before, had it gone to um, scorecards, Taylor would have won, but it would have been by split decision, which is unbelievable in itself. But um, he still would have won. But what a, what a broken fighter at the end of it, Mike. Oh, definitely. And the thing is, it's just, it's just one of those battles after fighting the absolute fight of his life. 
and almost coming through the other side to be stopped with two seconds remaining. They're the kind of things that haunt you forever, mm. you know, and some, some guys are able to bounce back from that. But when you look at, it's different if you just got tagged, if you just got tagged and just got stopped. But then when you, you learn about, you know, the, the facial injuries, facial deep lacerations, fractures in his jaw, yeah. um, bro broken nose, both eyes closed, cut over both eyes. When you look at the toll and the injuries and how much blood loss in the aftermath and what did it amount to? It amounted for nothing. Mm. You know, I think that it's a, it's a momentum killer, like we said before. And that fight would have taken a lot out of his soul, even with a victory. Yeah. But you guys know from being around fighters for many years, fighters hit the hardest times in their lives, usually coming out of adversity. Mm. And... The amount of damage that the kid would have done in the years to come from whether drugs, alcohol, other substances in his body to deal with the depression of that defeat, it's incalculable. And mm. I think that that's, you couple that within the other side of it, getting back in the ring, trying to prove himself, trying to fight. You know, I think even though they did have a rematch at which he was stopped in the eighth round, I think that that fight, that night was his peak. And he never quite remotely got near it. I just think that some fighters get haunted by the bad cards they dealt with. And I think that with Maldrick Taylor, that's a perfect example. Yeah, you're right. And Pete, I mean, I think another injury he had was he was urinating pure blood after the fight. So uh, it's not good. But, um, but there was some controversy, Pete, because um, first of all, I think before the fight, there was issues with uh, Richard Steele. Uh, being the referee, um, he did a lot of Don King fights, so there was a, a bit of an uproar about that. But there was also at the moment, I think there was probably two lots of controversy. One is that he stopped it when he did with less than ten seconds to go. But the other thing was that he didn't look at there was a blinking red light at the end at the back of the, the post that showed that it was under ten seconds to go, and he still made the decision to to stop the fight. So just even tougher pill to swallow. Yeah, look, you go to that fight and. You see, Melry Tully tried to push the fight and he, he kind of fell over. Chavez just stepped back a bit and he was that fatigue, he fell over. Mm. And then he kind of... It wasn't... Chavez looked tired as well. Chavez would only fight when Taylor would attack him. Mm. So that, that's... The, you know, it's, even if you get a cat in a corner and you start poking at a cat, it's going to fight back. He did say so, that too, Pete, in the interview afterwards that he was absolutely exhausted, Chavez said. It, it, yeah, so what... Melrick did. He, he's got his position. He's fallen over. Then they got in a little exchange and he started to showboat. Mm. So he's getting Chavez a little bit of, you know, he's warming him up a little. Chavez landed a right hand, left hook, sent his back foot wobbling. If you're Melrick Taylor now, you know there's less than 30 seconds to go. Yeah. Get on your bike. Or clinch. You haven't been warm once, once for holding. You haven't got no, you've got a stack of holdings to do. You've got whatever you want to do. And don't fall into a home Mary right, right hand. What he does, he gets hit. He's a bit wonky. Got it with the right hand. Got up. He was a little wobbly. Now, of course, Richard still is going to stop the fight. He's a house referee. He knows that the Golden Boy is just about to cop his first loss. And he's got his opportunity. Don King's going to love him for life. Don't, there's millions of dollars on the line. Don't give that guy the opportunity. I mean, Melry Taylor got up. He had a, he, Melry Taylor done what he had to do. He got up quick. He kind of was going to bounce. He was obviously hurt. Do you make the decision? Do I let him go? He could cop one punch it, puts him in a coma, and then that's the end of, you know, or do I stop the fight? Now, I think he should have given the fighter with two seconds to go an opportunity to at least see it out. So he stopped it at, I think, at round count eight, seven or eight. So... He didn't, you know, he didn't re another second and then he could have said to him, walk forward, walk back or whatever. Just let me have a look. Okay, you're right. Bang. It's the end of the fight. If yeah. Richard Steele was looking after Melry Taylor, Melry Taylor wins that fight because every ref can stall. Hmm. I mean, I've seen refs counting quarters. One, one and a quarter, one and a half, one and three quarter, two. They can't slow. They pause. They tell the guy to get in the, get corner. Back the corner. He could have yep. done all that. He could have done all that and then bang into the fight. Sorry. Okay, each go to your corner, get the scorecards out. He could have done that as well. That's why boxing's such a showmanship sport. And if you're on the A side, you've got that 
5149. And in this case, Melrick Taylor put all his cards on the table and gave him that 51. He shouldn't have been in that position. He didn't need to do that. The last 30 seconds to go and try and... I don't know what he was doing. It didn't matter if he won that round or if he didn't win that round. You did, I mean, when he was tied and he got hit with the first one, he could have taken a knee then mm. and taken an extra 10 seconds. I mean, the first way his back leg wobbled a bit and then he went into the corner and he finally got knocked out. If he had taken a knee then and waited 10 seconds, the fight would have been over. Well, Mike... And he gets up. I was just going to say, Mike, the, if you look at it closely too, the whole final sequence of events, it's almost like a dance routine. They almost are in sync to each other. And you can almost see that last right hand coming. It's almost like a series of movements and, and that of each fighter that accommodates I'll, I'll make just this, the right hand. I'll make this argument. If he got knocked down anywhere else in the ring, he wins the fight. Hmm. Anywhere else in the ring, doesn't matter where. In, in Chavez's corner, in the middle of the ring, on the rope, anywhere else in the ring he gets up, he makes it to the final bell. Richard still, his rationale for stopping it is he asked him twice if he was okay to be responsive, and he wasn't responsive. Mm -hmm. You can see that the kid, yeah, he's a bit dazed, maybe a lot dazed. He's looking to his right because Lou, Lou Duva has jumped on the apron. Hmm. which should have been a disqualification anyways. Yeah. Technically, you jump on the apron in the midst of the round, it's a disqualification. Lou might have thought he was being crafty and engineering a way to get his guy to finish line. I would cite that more for the reason why it got stopped than thrusting all the blame on the referee, Richard Still. Because if the kid's darting to the side, Richard Still maybe has the argument he didn't know that the light was flashing directly behind the kid's head. The kid wasn't responsive. The kid wasn't looking at him. Had the, had Duva not jumped on the apron and the kid didn't look at Richard still, then you can maybe say, okay, he wasn't responsive. I'm not sure. I, I think that the kid had enough in him. Did he have enough in him to take another flurry? No. Did he have enough in him to be able to look at the referee and say, nod his head and say he's okay? I think he did. Mm -hmm. But I think with all the chaos going on around him, it gave the rationale for the stoppage. And that's the thing too, Pete, isn't it? Because the official time was 2.58. So really, Chavez would not even have a chance to actually get across to Taylor before the bell rang. I know we can't sort of take that into consideration, but it's an amazing, wasn't it, that, to think that he wouldn't have even made it across to him. But do you think that, as Mike said, you had Lou Duva jump on the ring apron and he, he's actually been to blame for it because he diverted Taylor's attention away from Richard Steele's eyes to Lou Duva, who was jumping up on the ring canvas and probably doing what he does, took his focus away, and Richard Steele asked him once, if you look at it closely too, he asked him once, but the second time he asked him, he didn't even give him a chance to reply. He said, are you okay? Are you okay? And waved it off straight away. So it's, it's all just a series of, of just stuff ups, isn't it? I mean, really? Yeah, look, let's give Chavez a bit of praise here. He he did what great fighters do. Yep. He looked gone himself. He landed two massive right hands and he got he got Taylor on the ground and he got him concussed. Mm. So you've got to give kudos. Technically speaking, yeah, I, I suppose he, he could have given him a chance for the last two seconds. Obviously, it was chaos in his corner. Melrick Taylor didn't handle it too well. And I, I've had conversations with fighters before. If you're a gold medalist, Everything you do, touch, turns to gold. Even like Mike Tyson, for example, whoever he went to. I had a conversation with Zab Jun, I interviewed him. I said, when Zoo knocked you down, why did you jump straight back up that quick? Because he goes, I wanted to show that I wasn't hurt. And but guess what, you were it. hurt. Mm. And it was the worst thing you did because you lost your balance and it gave the referee a chance to stop the fight. I said, if someone had told you, when you get hurt, stay on a knee, till you hear seven and get up at eight. Give yourself as much possible time as you can. If you're really hurt and you're really hurt, go down and take a knee. Hmm. It's not bad to do that rather than put yourself in a, in a web of where it's just going to end up being horribly wrong for you. Hmm. It's like a, a timeout in a basketball. Sometimes things don't go well and the other team's got the momentum. Take your time out and that's taking a knee doing what you have to do to ruin that momentum for that moment. A lot of fighters don't ever get to do that. We saw Melrick Taylor in this fight 
He was a gold medalist. See, they probably no one ever told him to do that. I mean, that, the, uh, with 26 seconds, when he got that big second hand and the, big, the, the first right hand and the left hook and it kind of wobbled his back leg, he was basically gone there. Yeah, he was, yeah. And then Chavez sort of lured him into the corner and landed the next right hand. If he had have taken a knee up just right there, thought, I'm not right, I'm five or six up, I'm going to give him a 10-8 round, I'm going to listen to eight, get straight back up, it's the end of the fight. Yeah, again, it's not you know, and still couldn't, kicking in. Yeah, it's, like, it's not that warrior mentality, mm, but, but he would have got the W. Mm. He would have got the W. Yeah. That's what this sport's all about. Each time you get a paycheck and, it, and you get that W, your paycheck's going to keep going up. Mm. So he's been a brave warrior. It gets, it gets the losses. It yeah. just doesn't work that way. But I'm, it's easy in hindsight. But when I was watching that fight, I just kept thinking, Chavez is going to pull something out. He's going to pull... I can't see him losing this fight. Mm. He's going to pull something out. I just had that... You know, when you watch something, it's like watching a great footy club. Mm. The 11 points down with 50 seconds to go. Yeah. You go, this is an over. Bang, they get a goal. It's 10 seconds to go. And if I, you go, I, I think they're going to still win. Free, stupid free kick out of the centre. He marks right on the side and he kicks a winning goal. Mm. You don't give him that opportunity. Yeah, you just no, don't. Exactly, mate. And, Mike, I think it was a, a credit to Chavez pretty much straight after the fight when they interviewed him. The very first thing he did say was that, hey, this guy deserves a rematch. You know, he was very, very humble, I thought, in the interview. It's who he is. Mm. It's who he is. A lot of people, I think a lot of people, historically at that time anyways, got drawn into various battles. Latino versus America. Don King versus Bob Arum or Dover or whatever it is. But really, if you go in context, listen to Chavez, see what his general outward, outward uh, words were that fueled him for his career, he was always a humble gladiator, always very respectful mm. of his opponents. He was. You look at guys, you know, Roger Mayweather, good example. He stopped Roger Mayweather in two rounds, rematched him. You know, the, the rematch was a different result. Roger Mayweather pushed him deeper. But, you know, even with, um, I know he lost to Frankie Randell. But he could have just moved on and said, you know what? Yeah, that's too hard to fight stylistically and shied away from it. Then you look at, look at his mentality when he knew in his heart he was far over the hill. He still went into the lion's den against, uh, against Kostya Zou. And Dilahoya. You know, he fought, mm. he fought, yeah. he fought Dilahoya twice. Mm. He, he knew he was, he was up against it. He knew that he was you know, in the process of fading at that part of his career. But he always had that mentality. Mm. That's that's why yeah. that's why so many people classify him the greatest Mexican fighter of all time. Yeah, well, I, I certainly do, and I think I, I had him in my uh, top ten that we did a few weeks ago all time. And this was probably I think I said on the night that this was probably the, one of the main reasons I did it because champions and legends find a way, and he found a way, and and not just that he he fought Pernell Whitaker, he fought De La Hoya. I mean, you you name the, the Haugans, the Camachos, you name it. He fought them, Ramirez, Rosario. It didn't matter who they were, and like you said, he fought them multiple times if if need be. And, and that is the epitome of a legend. And um, you know, I think we spoke about maybe Canelo maybe being uh, right up his behind, but at the moment, mate, I, I think that Julio Cesar Chavez is, is is the best Mexican, or greatest Mexican fighter of all time. Um, so just a, another um, couple of tidbits on this one. It was actually Rick voted Ring Magazine's 1990 Fight of the Year, and then ultimately it would. And it was 1990 when it happened, of course. It was um, it was actually voted the fight of the decade at the end of of the 90s as well. So and it had a, a monumental effect on both guys, I think, and especially for Meldrew Taylor, who was never the same. And uh, even though he got his rematch uh, and won that next version of the title, uh, unfortunately, if you look at him today, he's not um, he's not in very good shape, Mike. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. It's a shame with Taylor, just in terms of... He, he fought on at least five years too long mm. from where he was... Well, probably actually about six years too long, but it was the damage of the lifestyle, gym wars, mm. getting stopped a few times, and to see some of the names of the guys that defeated him late career, mm. it's tragic to see guys like that can claim a win over a legendary fighter. But like I've said on this program before... We measure fighters by the heights of their primes, not by their downfalls. Yeah. So Taylor, to me, will always be a great fighter. He's a two-weight world champion. And, yeah, did he underachieve in the eyes of some people? Yeah, but he's still left behind a fantastic legacy. 
Mm. No, well said. All right, guys. Well, that's uh, it for this week. Um, well, is, uh, next week, it's yep. my, my yep. pick, isn't it? Your turn, week. mate. Yep. So who are you thinking? I'm thinking Oscar De La Hoya, Pernell Whitaker, April 1997, Thomas Mack Center. Well, I think you can give us a good insight on that one because I think you were sitting ringside from memory. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing that one. So next week, Oscar De La Hoya, Pernell Whitaker, classic fight. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again, guys. Thanks.